Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody. Welcome to New Books and Film, a podcast channel of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Dan Moran, and I am thrilled to be here today with Dwayne Epstein, author of Killing Generals, The Making of the Dirty Dozen, the most iconic World War II movie of all time, just published in 2023 by Citadel Press. Dwayne Epstein has written on a number of film-related subjects, such as Oliver Stone, Francis Ford Coppola, Woody Allen, and Clint Eastwood. He's also the author of the 2013 New York Times bestselling biography, Lee Marvin, Point Blank, which of course is a perfect segue into his new work about the Dirty Dozen. Welcome, Dwayne. Thank you for having me, Dan. So I read this book in a day, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And you are the uber fan of this film. Now, somebody out there listening to the New Books Network and New Books and Film might think, okay, yes, by all means, we need these books on important films like Citizen Kane and High Noon and and Apocalypse Now. But why do we need a book about the Dirty Dozen? Well, um, a couple of reasons. One being, um, at the time of its release, it was the, ah, there you are. It was the number one uh, movie of the year. Um, and the sixth highest grossing film in the history of MGM. So it was definitely worthy of a re-examination. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of lucked into this project and I was re- often wondering, how come nobody ever did it before? A book on the Dirty Dozen, because it's over 50 years old. And you would have thought somebody along the way would have done that, but they didn't. Another reason I think is that it wasn't just the financial impact the book had, uh, excuse me, the film had, but more importantly, the cultural and societal impact because of the timing of the film release, it was kind of a perfect storm in that the country was going through, uh, you know, in 1967, was going through a, a, a flux, a kind of a post-adolescent sea change in the way people thought and what they did. And, and uh, the Vietnam War was escalating. And there was a lot of mis- a beginning of mistrust and cynicism of a lot of our cultural institutions, be it film or the government, big business. And The Dirty Dozen proved to be the perfect film for that mindset, for that change of mindset. Because critics at the time, a lot of people thought it got uh, bad reviews. It got mixed reviews. And many critics of the time focused on the kind of antisocial and and anti-authoritative attitude of both the movie and uh, the main characters. And the interesting thing is, it didn't matter, except for the fact that it was rather violent, it didn't matter the uh, side of the fence you were on, whether you were a hawk or a dove, they, you know, everybody had their own point, excuse me, their own point of view about the impact of the film. And if you were a hawk, it's go get them, you know, let's kill Nazis. If you're a dove, you're kind of like, well, this just shows you what morons the military can be. So everybody was able to, you know, have their take on that. I think the only other movie you would probably be able to say that about was maybe Patton that came out a few years later. Um, but I shouldn't say the only movie. Um, one of the more popular ones. That that point of view of, of uh, you know, throughout the 60s, the, the lack of uh, lack of respect in of, of the military and, and dark humor, like in MASH and other films that came out later, it pretty much started with The Dirty Dozen. Hence the reason for the book. That's a great thing you said about Patton too, because you can imagine that different audiences could watch the opening, the famous opening of Patton as rah-rah, or they can see it like ironically. Right, exactly. That's yeah. exactly my point. And also, you just mentioned something about authority, and that's a theme that runs through the book that I, that I had seen The Dirty Dozen a hundred times starting when I was a kid that never really occurred to me because it's funny because I'd like you to talk about that a little more. It's this anti-authority film, but yet part of the movie is, of course, about the 12 guys submitting to Lee Marvin's authority and understanding that he is the boss, right? Like, So, so do you think the movie has it two ways or both ways? Or how, how do you, what do you make of that? Well, yeah, I definitely do. Um, you know, the movie starts with uh, Lee Marvin's character, John Reisman, getting, um, well, being told what the mission is, but also being berated and belittled by his superiors, Ernest Borgnine and uh, um, um, Robert Weber, and uh, also, well, as later in the movie, Robert Ryan, who is like his rival. Um, 
And so from the very beginning of the movie, the point of view is shown to be that of anti-authoritative and anti-military. And then it goes even deeper once we meet the dozen. And they're a motley crew, <laughs> to uh, use a cliche. And it's, a, you know, to my mind, I saw it when I was a kid too, but I saw it on TV, as you mentioned earlier, and I can remember, and like I said, it was shown in two parts, and I, to this day, whenever I watch it, and I watch it a lot, I can remember the exact moment part one ended, and the next night part two would begin. The exact moment, it's just when he, uh, when Lee Marvin puts forth the idea of having war games and testing the dozens of ability with Robert Redford, what, excuse me, Robert Ryan, and I couldn't, I couldn't wait for the next night. Matter of fact, once they started putting stuff out on video, on VHS, that was one of the first movies I bought was The Dirty Dozen. So yeah, I guess I am an Uber fan, but I gotta tell you, I had, my best friend and I, we used to watch it so often, it got to the point, <laughs> he's gonna hate me saying this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. It got to the point where when every one of us weren't, weren't doing anything that night, we called the other one up and it got to the point where we, we we wouldn't even mention the movie. The phone would ring. I'd pick it up, and my buddy Mike would go, and I would go, all right, come on over. <laughs> and we'd watch over and over and over again. Your book begins with an epigraph by a famous director, Ron Howard. And I just want to read a little bit of this and talk about your choice of epigraph. He says that the movie was perfect. He says he was 12 or 13 when he first saw it. And here's what he says. Everything about it, top to bottom, was cool, and it turned me on to the movies. In a lot of ways, it made me want to go to the movies every single week to try to have that kind of experience that would just take you away. Now, you just mentioned that the first time you saw it when you were a kid. What do you think has stayed with you since you were a kid, and what has gotten more complicated in the way you view the film? Well, I can tell you, um, when I first saw the film, what I loved about it wasn't even so much the story, because I was... Like Ron Howard, I was about the same age. I was like 12 years old, although he's a few years older than me. Um, but what stayed with me were these, these trippy, trippy characters. I mean, I had never seen a character like John Cassavetes' Victor Franco in a movie before. And he was and remains my favorite thing in the film. He, the, you know, his attitude about everything was just so punky. I, I mean, he was like a punk, a street kid. And, you know, that... That was my first reaction. That stayed with me. I, and then, you know, years later, I not only would see it on TV and on uh, VHS, but I would go to revival theaters whenever they would show it. And I live in L.A. So um, I live in L.A. I was born in New York. And, and like you, I spent a number of years in New Jersey, not too far from Rutgers. Anyway, um, whenever they would show it on TV, I mean, in the, in the art theaters, I would see it because there's a lot of revival theaters out here. And to see it on the big screen, is a whole other experience. Just amazing. I know when it first came out, a couple of theaters or MGM decided to re re-strike it in uh, the film in 70 millimeter, which is an even bigger print. But a lot of critics didn't like it. They said it looked uh, fa not faded, but but it was kind of blurry. And that's what happens when you do stuff like that. But other than that, yeah. It's it's just an incredible experience as a film. And it's a real movie movie, not not you know, not streaming, not episodic, not a franchise, although it became a franchise later on TV. But you know, I have very uh, um, strong opinions about contemporary filmmaking nowadays. It's either you know, a comic book series or or, or an action film franchise, or in some cases where you know it's like a, a, a disneyland ride and that to me is not a movie a movie is all about story and character and and also takes you someplace that you've never been to before or you've been there before and you want to relive it that kind of thing that's what movies should be the best of movies are that and i don't see that as much anymore it's kind of sad and i'm not a prude about it i don't care about uh sexual content obscenity uh graphic violence vulgarity that doesn't bother me what bothers me is bad filmmaking. 
<clears throat> yeah, one of the things you point out in the book is is that the is we'll get into the direction of it in a little bit, but the how the look of the movie is so good, like all those browns, and 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 there's no CGI, and and how you get the sense that you're out there with these guys in a way that even as a kid you can't articulate, but as a, as a little kid you almost think like, is this a hidden camera? Is did they film this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know Robert Aldridge, um, the director, he had you know. A specific intent of how the movie should look and that's why uh one of the people i interviewed for the um the book was one of the cast members a guy named colin maitland he was one of what they call the uh the back six of the dozen and he told me that one of the reasons why it took longer to make the movie than what they had uh, planned um schedule wise as well as the budget was that aldridge covered everything he he would shoot a scene several times with multiple cameras and you know one reason being that it would give him choices in the editing room. But most importantly, a given scene would have different angles in the whole scene. He would shoot it from the, you know, from a crane on top. He would, he would dig a hole in uh, the ground where the camera was and shoot it from the bottom up, like in that opening scene of Wheatley Marvin witnessing the hanging, where the camera is set in the trap door. And I mean, just some brilliantly nuanced set pieces in that movie that's not highly stylized, but stylized enough to keep the viewer interested. Yeah. It's great stuff. It is great. It is great stuff. So the first part of your book tells the story of E.M. Nathanson writing the novel and all these rumors about the source of the plot. And this was all news to me. I went around telling everyone that I know who loves this movie. I'm like, did you know this story about Russ Meyer? And, and everyone said, no, no, no. So you tell this story about Russ Meyer working as a photographer for the Third Army under Patton. <laughs> I was like, and I'm, I'm sitting holding the book saying, Does, am I the only one that doesn't know this? Like, what, how did I get it this far and not know this? So this was all news to me, and I'd love you to share that with the listeners. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. I have to tell you, um, I, you know, in doing the research for the book, I got extremely lucky with some of the uh, things I discovered, that being one of them, thing about uh, Russ Meyer's involvement, but also um, a friend of mine who's also a writer, her name is Beverly Gray. She wrote a wonderful book about the making of The Graduate called Seduced by Mrs. Robinson. And she had told, when I told her what I was working on, she told me she did an interview with Ian e. Nathanson uh, about a year or two before he died. And it was going to be published, but it wasn't. So it was an unpublished interview. And she asked if I'd be interested. And I went, oh, oh, hell yes, definitely. So in the interview, a lot of what has never been known about the creation of the Dirty Dozen was stated by uh, Mick Nathanson. That's what his friends called him, Mick. And that included uh, the Russ Meyer story. Uh, Russ Meyer was friends with Nathanson and just rather matter of factly in conversation one night, he, he told uh, um, Mick about, um, oh yeah, that reminds me of the Dirty Dozen. And Nick Nathanson was like, what the hell is the Dirty Dozen? And Russ Meyer told him that when he was working as a photographer in World War II, um, he, uh, he took some photos of some POWs, not, no, not POWs, excuse me, army convicts that were being trained for a mission. And then he said, he turned the film in and nobody knows what happened to the film. I mean, there's a little bit more involved in that, which you can read in the book. But once he told Mick Nathanson, Nathanson's reaction was, and this is a quote, he goes, the hackles on the back of my neck stood up. I had never heard of a story like this before. And then he proceeded to research it and find out. He went to the uh, Library of Congress. He went to the US military records um, and tried to find out more. And it turns out they just didn't exist. And it's not that Russ Meyer necessarily made the story up so much as it was more of a, what was it that uh, McNathanson called it? A latrine rumor. <laughs> and uh, so he ultimately, in, in his quest to find out about the real Dirty Dogs, and he also went through other uh, forms of research, such as reading the trial transcripts of men during the war who were convicted for very, very heinous crimes, murder, rape, uh, uh, grand theft, things like that. And, it, and, 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 in, and in reading this information, as well as talking to specialists about it, he decided, I'm gonna make this a work of fiction and I'm gonna make it all up myself. And that's how it happened. 
Yeah, that's great. That's great. It's such a great story. It's, it's like you said, latrine. What was it a latrine story or a latrine rumor? Yeah, that's what he called it. Yeah, that's great. So, so Nathan's finishing the Nathan's finishing the novel at the same time that MGM is casting it and actually working on the screenplay. It reminded me about how like the making of two thousand and one, how Arthur C. Clarke is writing the screenplay and the novel at the same time Kubrick's making the movie. So there's all these moving parts that are going on at once, and then things get messy because Nathanson does not like the first screenplay in which the convicts don't blow up the chateau. They destroy a factory where the V2 rocket is being developed. So why didn't he like that? Because on paper, it seems like that's as good as a target as any, right? Why didn't he well, like that? Well, the problem was the, uh, for, for Mick Nathanson was that where uh, the V2 rocket was being um, um, researched, uh, Pearl, Mud, Pearl something or other, it's a German name, scientists and their families lived there, including children. And that really bugged Nathanson. And it's kind of understandable, actually. So he he approached um, the head of MGM and asked if he could uh, write the screenplay. And he did write a screenplay. They paid him for it, but it wasn't used. They didn't like it. Um, he included too much of a backstory to all of the dozen, from what I understand. And so uh, another writer was commissioned. And then another writer after him. <laughs> Well, it's funny because in the novel, which I picked up in preparation for this interview, you know, it's it's a solid 400 pages before the mission begins because you do get so many of the backstories in a way that they're just they're just X'd out of the film. Right. Yeah. And from what I understand, what Nathanson told Beverly Gray was that one of the things he had written in the screenplay was one of probably the most haunting and harrowing backstories was the one of the uh, black soldier. Um, in the book, his name is Napoleon White. In the movie, it's uh, Robert Jefferson. And he tells that backstory in the screenplay. And also, uh, you know, his char the character of Napoleon White um, murdering the guy who had um, defamed him. For, like, I don't want to go into details about what happened to him, but um, that, was, that was in the backstory. And Nathanson said he wrote it as a kind of a pre-credit crawl, and like a prologue. And it's funny because Robert Aldridge as a director really kind of pioneered that. Almost every film he ever made when he had the authority to do films on his own and not just told by the studio, he always had a prologue. And speaking of that kind of thing, one of the things I actually miss in movies are the opening credits. They don't have opening credits in movies anymore. And I don't know why. I think it's laziness personally on the part of the filmmaker. It's like, well, nobody really cares who in this, who's in this or who did the makeup or this and that and other. Let's just go right to the story. Well, knowing who's involved in a movie, if you're a movie fan such as I, uh, it really helps you enjoy the film. Because in my mind, I got a Rolodex of movie uh, um, you know, of filmmakers. And I'll go, oh, yeah, I remember he did that movie. He did this movie. He did, you know, or she did the costumes or she did the editing. And that reminds me of a certain style, and I'll look for it when I watch the movie. Instead, they put it on at the end of the movie, the credits. And I can't stand that. Yeah, well, the Dirty Dozen has that great credit sequence in the opening where they're all lining up, and you see, and it's in that that perfect font, and it all scrolls down the screen. It's like a nice security blanket for people of our age for what movies used to be like in, in the late '60s and the '70s. Indeed, and 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 they're not quite compatible to the faces you see on screen but it's right. pretty close when they do things yeah they catch up they catch up at some moments yes. well, well let's talk about you just mentioned robert aldrich again this is a great time to ask ken hyman is a producer and robert aldrich gets the job to direct so why robert aldrich well robert aldrich and ken hyman had worked together previously a couple of years earlier on uh, who's afraid who's afraid whatever happened to baby jane and he, uh, what's his, and, and Ken Hyman enjoyed working with him. Um, but Ken Hyman told me, he's still alive, by the way. He's uh, like 93 years old. He's living in England and enjoying himself immensely. And he told me that Robert Aldridge could be a son of a bitch to work with, but he was a straight shooter and he knew what he was doing and he was very tough. And it shows in the movies he made, man. I mean, you look at whatever, whatever happened to Baby Jane, that might be considered, um, for lack of a better term, a ladies' film or whatever because of the two leads, but it is not, as far as I'm concerned. It's a tough, tough movie, boy. And he gives no quarter. He, he, he puts it out there, as he does with all of his films. I happen to think, amongst movie fans, he's known, but I happen to think in the general public, 
he's largely forgotten and underrated. And I think that's criminal. I really do. He should be much more lauded. He should be up there with the likes of John Ford and, 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 uh, and, and Don Siegel and other great directors who have a wonderful reputation and legacy. But for some reason, he's not. You can mention some of the films he's done and people will go, oh, yeah, I love that movie. Who directed it? It's Robert Aldridge. Right. You know, you ever seen the movie Flight of the Phoenix? With Jimmy Stewart? Yep. No, I have not. But it's it's on my great list. Movie. Yeah. Yeah, Robert Aldridge directed it, and it's 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 tension personified. I would stack it up against any Hitchcock movie in terms of the way the odds are put against the survivors of a plane crash and and how, what they go through, and it, it's it's just brilliant. It really is. I'm Another example of. I was just I'm smiling. I'm smiling because when I read your the you, you mentioned it in the book and I, I thought to myself, I gotta see this movie already. Yeah, it's great. I'll tell you another really good example. And Leonard Malton called this film um an audience movie, if ever there was one. Remember the movie The Longest Yard? Yeah, sure. With Britt Reynolds? Yep, okay. which he directed. That, yeah. Yep. That was that was an Aldridge film. And Len, Leonard Malton's right. I saw it in the theaters. It is definitely an audience film. Pe- you know, people are cheering as if that would have an outcome in the game of the, you know, the football game of the guards against the, uh, uh, right. the prisoners. That's how much people got into that film. And it's really well done. It really is. And it's also another movie about, you know, anti-authority involving prisoners. You bet. Absolutely right. It was just, it was the first hit since the dirty dozen that Robert Aldridge had. And, he, you know, and there's a lot of uh, parallels there. It, he didn't go too far afield from the Dirty Dozen. Yeah. And the reason why he looked for uh, projects with that sense of, of anti-authority uh, was because Aldridge was quite the maverick and rebel himself. He hated the studio system. He launched his own production company, bought a studio with the profits he got from the Dirty Dozen to make his own films. And all of his films were extremely offbeat. He didn't make studio films. He made movies he wanted to make. And I applaud that. So let's well, let's talk about the actors in the in the film, right? We can go through them because now it's that the movie's a who's who, right? But actually, before we do that, let's talk about the the one of the famous actors who was asked to be in the film who refused it was John Wayne. who who, if you didn't know, if you you know, if you want to be counterfactual, you could imagine John Wayne playing, you know, uh um uh, the major's part, your Bryce's voice prince part. Why did John Wayne not want to do the movie? Well, that that's been a, a rumor that's been bandied about for years, and and the rumor that's often said is that he didn't like the ending. He didn't think his fans would want to see him incinerate a bunch of Nazis. And when Lee Marvin was told about it before he started filming, he he did a typical Lee Marvin take. He went, "I got no problem with that." <laughs> so. But the fact of the matter is there were many reasons why John Wayne turned it down. That actually was one of them, but it wasn't the main reason. The main reason was when he read the script, I don't know if you know that much about uh, John Wayne's politics. By the way, I'm a fan. I I love some of his films. Um, But his politics were to the right of Barry Goldwater. I mean, he was a, a very conservative man. And when he read the script, he wrote a memo to Ken Hyman that said, whoever wrote this piece of junk must be a long-haired, sandal-wearing hippie skipping college and carrying a sign that um, says he doesn't want a war that he himself should be fighting. Now, what's interesting about that comment was the screenplay was written by a man who was 66 years old, long, long out of college, okay? And he didn't even necessarily hold the views that John Wayne thought he was holding. It was, it was uh, Mel Johnson, the Academy Award-winning screenwriter, of the Grapes of Wrath. So, I mean, he he just thought the whole project, John Wayne just thought the whole project was mean-spirited and uh, what have you. And ultimately, almost as the very next year, he had done this before John Wayne in the 50s. He saw High Noon and he hated it. And he decided to make another movie that was kind of an answer to High Noon, which was Rio Bravo. Great movie, by the way. Well, John Wayne's answer to The Dirty Dozen was The Green Berets. And it's a gung-ho, let's go get them, boys, war movie. And by the time the film came out, that attitude really didn't exist anymore, except maybe in John Wayne's head. So, they, oh, he, And he co-directed it, too. Yeah. 
So, so Wayne says, Wayne says no, but we get Lee Marvin. I, I can you said it's an iconic film. That's an iconic part. I mean, that and point blank is, and, you know, there's a handful of movies that really define the Lee Marvin persona. Right. So, so let's, let's start with him. What did Lee Marvin think about making the film? How was he on set? You know, to any, anything that, that fans of the film would want to know. Well, I don't want to give away too much because I want fans of the film to read the book, but I'll say this. I was lucky enough when I was working on the Lee Marvin bio, I was lucky enough to interview a gentleman by the name of Bob Phillips. And Bob Phillips was a very interesting character. Um, he played Corporal Morgan in the movie, but he had a more important job. Ken Hyman hired him um, to also uh, be Lee Marvin's bodyguard, which is what Hyman called it. Bob Phillips called it being Lee Marvin's babysitter. And his, his role was very important. His role was to make sure Lee Marvin showed up on time, sober, which he didn't always do until Bob Phillips uh, stepped in. And most of the time, everybody got along with each other and Lee Marvin. They, you know, the other actors were uh, very uh, impressed with Lee Marvin and his performance. And at the time that he agreed to make the film, he was on a hell of a streak. He, during the making of the movie, he. He won the Oscar for Capaloo. And before that, he had uh, won the British film, uh, no, the BAFTA, that's what it was, the British Academy of Film and Television. And he had won for Capaloo and uh, the movie The Killers. It was for two roles, uh, which was a movie that was made for television. But at the time it was being made, John F. Kennedy had just been assassinated. So they thought it was too violent for TV and they released it to the theaters. Um, so he was on a hell of a role, especially when it came to action pictures. And he did, you know, The Killers, uh, a wonderful dramatic role in Ship of Fools, Capaloo, then The Dirty Dozen, then Point Blank, um, Hell in the Pacific. He basically, at the beginning of the decade, at the beginning of the 1960s, he became this country's newest action film star. And The Dirty Dozen really drove that home. It's, it's, you know, it still remains his most popular film. I would ask people if they ever heard of Lee Marvin when I was working on the bio, and they would say, mm, that sounds familiar, but I don't know. And then I would say, have you heard of a movie called The Dirty Dozen? And they would go, oh, yeah, I love that movie. And I'd be like, that's the guy, that guy. So that was the effect that film had on his career, as well as how everybody got along with it. And, you know, Bob Phillips told me some great, great anecdotes of what Lee was like both on set and off camera. They would party at night because... Bob Phillips told Lee, look, I'll make a deal with you. Stay sober till five o'clock. And then after five, I'll, I'll match you drink for drink anywhere you want. And on the weekends, too. But, and, and Lee Marvin said, OK. And that's what they did. And <laughs> they got in, into some pretty wild adventures. The whole movie was filmed in England. And they had a few run-ins in some of the more famous pubs of London. So it was interesting. All right, let's get some more characters in here or some more cast members. Let's go on to Charles Bronson. Uh, oh, yeah, there's an interesting thing about Bronson, too. Bronson really didn't like making the movie, um, mainly because he was he was getting divorced from his first wife and he was engaged to Jill Ireland, who, ironically, she's British, okay? Charles Bronson was born and raised in Pennsylvania, coal mining town. Um, and here he was in love with an English woman, but he's in Europe, he's in England. Jill Ireland got a role on a TV show being shot in California. So, you know, they're missing each other. And the entire time, that really upset Charles Bronson. He was not some. I love that Bob Phillips and Lee Marvin had a nickname for Bronson. They called him Charlie Sunshine because he was always pissed off. <laughs> and it really didn't help his career as much. I mean, he was very good in it. Don't get me wrong. He was perfectly cast. And he had been working in, the, in the movies as long as Lee Marvel. As a matter of fact, they both made their uh, screen debut in the same film. Now, consequently, Bronson served a much longer apprentice. It took a number of years for him to be established, and it was rather ironic that he went back to California to, after the movie was over to marry Jill Ireland, and then he was offered another movie in Europe, and he stayed in Europe, and he became a superstar in Europe. And... and you know, he was better off, you know, across across the continent than he was in this country. But once he established himself about five to seven years later, he became a superstar and he stayed there, making the kind of films that were tailor-made for him. 
And he was very good in them. I'm a fan of his as well. You mentioned John Cassavetes before as being one of your favorite things about the film. And you talk in the book about how he would use his money for movies to then go and finance his own films, right? It's good. It reminded me of what Orson Welles did. What was John Cassavetes like on the set? How did he approach the role? Why do you think he was so good in it? Well, I think, you know, and they, when they do the trailer for the movie, um, in the trailer, there's a guy narrating saying something about how, I think there's a little bit of, of, of I think it's a Reichman and every man. Well, there's a lot of Franco and everybody. I Well, it, in, when I was growing up, I was a lot like Franco. I was a troublemaker. I was always shooting my mouth off when I shouldn't. And I personally think Cassavetes enjoyed making the movie. Um, but he didn't like the way it turned out because he's not a fan of necessarily war films to begin with. He loved the character, but he didn't care for the ending. Um, and he did the movie because he was threatened by Ken Hyman. <laughs> He said, uh, well, he was also facing a lawsuit from Universal because he had he had a contract with them to make one more movie and he didn't want to do another movie. So he kind of, um, I, I forgot how it played out, but it, I wrote it in, in my book. Ken Hyman said, do the Dirty Dozen and you can get the money to make your own film like you want to do. And so ultimately, um, John Cassavetes acquiesced. He agreed. Um, but I, I, you know, he was just a wonderful actor. And he got along well with everybody. Jim Brown, in his autobiography, said, and I love that he used this phrase, he referred to John Cassavetti as a mystic teacher, a mentor to everybody. Whatever mood he was in on a given day and how he had to play the scene, he would be that way all day, and so would the rest of the cast. If he had to be moody, the rest of the cast was moody. If he was playful, the rest of the cast was playful. I mean, that was the, uh, the ability... Cassavetes had over everybody else in the movie and and it shows in the performance he's he's just incredible in it and he was the only one to get Oscar nominated for the for his performance and once again ironically enough he lost that Oscar to George Kennedy his co-star in the Dirty Dozen but George Kennedy was in Cool Hand Luke and he won for that and by the way very deserving I thought George Kennedy was great in that movie you just mentioned Jim Brown's autobiography. Let's talk about him for a second. Let, let, the Jim Brown story is fascinating. Yeah, yes, it is. Um, I discovered something. A lot of people who were around in that time remembered that um, there was this big controversy about whether or not he was going to go back for the 67 NFL season. And he, you know, the movie was running over budget over time. And there was a flurry of, of messages back and forth. And one of the, uh, I think the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, Carol Rosenblum, was told to go to England and talk to Jim Brown and see what his plans are and this, that, and the other. And then the owner of the, uh, of the Cleveland Browns, who was, I forgot his name, it's in the book, he issued an ultimatum to Jim Brown. If you don't come back in time, you're going to be fined $100 a day. And by the way, as that football Owner said $100 a day of lunch money. But um, he issued an ultimatum that he had to be back on a given date. And Jim Brown held a press conference the next day saying he was retiring from the NFL. And you can't buy publicity like that. I mean, you know, people, people would see that on the daily news and go, ooh, this movie is that good. I got to see it, right? And what, what's interesting to me is I discovered in doing research that most, there was a lot of, uh, um, sports writers writing opinion pieces about whether or not Jim Brown was going to retire, whether Jim Brown is going to pursue an acting career uh, or if he's going to stay in the NFL, all of it was unnecessary because even before he started making the movie, he had told a, a, a Los Angeles based African-American newspaper, I am retiring from the NFL. And he said that before he started the movie, the thing is, you know, white sports writers don't read the Los Angeles Sentinel, which is, which was an African-American newspaper. So, you know, and Jim Brown stayed quiet about it until he made the actual announcement. So it's interesting the way it played out. From Jim Brown, let's go to Telly Savalas, who as a kid, I of course knew from Kojak, from my parents watching Kojak all the time, but this was a big thing for him too. Oh, yes. He, um, he actually had many, many jobs before he became an actor. One of them was a TV executive. Um, I think he worked for CBS. And he was friends with Burt Lancaster. And it was Burt Lancaster who talked him into becoming an actor. And he did a couple of small roles. 
for Burt Lancaster. And ultimately, he got an Oscar nomination for his performance in Birdman of Alcatraz with Burt Lancaster. And he was wonderful. Um, and then he started getting more roles. One of the things he did when he did The Greatest Story Ever Told, like a year or two before um, um, The Dirty Dozen, I believe, I could be wrong, but I think he played Pontius Pilate. In any event, he didn't like the way he was losing his hair and he had one of those crowns around his head um, and a bald pate. So he decided, I'm going to shave it all off. So nobody will know if I'm really bald or not, or how bald I am. And he liked that look, and he kept it. And it certainly worked in uh, The Dirty Dozen and Kojak and everything he's done since. So um, it's interesting. His character, and I didn't know until I read the book, his character is actually three different characters melded into one. In the book, three of the dozen, excuse me, one's a racist bigot from, the, from uh, um, Alabama or Arkansas, something like that. Another is a uh, sexual predator, and another is a religious fanatic. And what uh, Nunnally Johnson did was he combined all three of those characters into Archer Maggot, which I thought was interesting. And apparently the character of Archer Maggot that Nathanson wrote was mainly the bigot, and he was based on a real person in a town near, um, I want to say Fort Benning, somewhere, somewhere in Arkansas or Alabama, and he was a torpedo for the local mob. Phoenix City, that was it. It was called Phoenix City. And he was a torpedo for the local mob. And he got his jollies beating people up, especially black people. Um, so there was, there was some basis of fact in that, at least. And um, it, it, he, he wasn't really so much a leading man after the Dirty Dozen, but he was one hell of a strong character actor. You believed everything he ever did in a movie. And... Jim Brown, I love this. Jim Brown wrote this autobiography that when they first screened the film, I think at MGM in, in London, after Telly Savalas' death scene, Telly Savalas elbowed Jim Brown sitting next to him and went, well, Maggot's dead. The movie's not interesting, not worth seeing anymore as far as I'm concerned. And he got up and walked out. <laughs> he, he thought the best thing in the movie was his own performance. Um, but yeah, it was... It was a really great performance on his part, and he's scary as hell. He really is. Yeah, he is. So last actor I want to ask you about in the cast who who had a, a long career after this is Donald Sutherland. Yeah, I, I got very fortunate. I was able to interview Donald Sutherland um, via some emails in the uh, um, Q&A. And um, yeah, that, that movie actually did launch his career. He had been working before that. He, could, he did a couple of cheap horror movies, and he was on... You know, Hammer horror movie, and he was on um, some, some TV shows on the BBC. But um, what's interesting is that one great scene that he had wasn't meant for, uh, for him. It was written for Clint Walker, and Clint Walker didn't want to do it. And he has his own reason. He had his own reason for not doing it. I had interviewed Clint Walker too when I was working on the Lee Marvin bio, and he gave me some great insight. Nice man. Um, Donald Sutherland uh, agreed to do that scene of of being the fake general inspecting the troops. And he's very funny in it. It's, it's, it's one of the funniest scenes in the movie. And he used that scene to get a part in a movie that was made two years later. Um, he sent it to the producer and the movie was MASH and it worked. That's how he got MASH. Another anti-authority, you know, uh, war movie. Big time. Big time, yeah. So. Um, so those are the, and there's more people in the cast, but just I want to look at the big picture now as we start to look at the, the the whole story. The subtitle of your book calls it the most iconic World War II movie of all time. So you mentioned this a little bit. You said it got mixed reviews when it came out in 1967. You know what did what did people what did critics and audiences like about it? What did they not like about it? Well, those who liked it liked the fact that it was for uh, you know a military themed film was anti authority and in some ways it was anti military. Um, although it was, I don't know if you would necessarily call it anti-war uh, <clears throat> because I'm of a very strong opinion that a movie can't be anti-war if they're going to have war scenes. I mean, there's some great ones, Pads of Glory. Um, recently, they remade All Quiet on the Western Front. And, you know, Bridge on the River Kwai, in its own way, is a uh, anti-war film. But if you're going to have that much action in a film, I'm not sure you can consider a war film anti-war. But that's a whole other argument. That's what the critics who liked about the movie, well, I mean, the critics who liked the movie, that's what they liked about it. And what's interesting is the critics who didn't like it, didn't like it for the exact same reason. They, um, I think it was Bosley Crowell 
of the New York Times who, were, who, who called it a, uh, a spirit of brazen hooliganism unseen in motion picture history. And to him, that's a bad thing, which, you know, from his point of view, maybe it is. I don't know. Um, and I think, I think it was Richard Schickel in uh, Time magazine uh, liked it for the same reason most people hated it or, or who didn't like it, didn't like it. And he made sense of it. And, and there was like some raging controversy going on with Esquire magazine respond the, and they gave it a good review responding to some other magazine I don't I don't remember by calling the writer of that piece from the other magazine out and calling him basically you know a wimp and a wussy <laughs> that that you 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 really got to get a spine and stop whining I mean it was amazing to me that this kind of thing was going on and uh, it was interesting once again like I said it wound up being not only written about in terms of reviews, but it was making headlines in, I mean, like major headlines in uh, daily in daily variety for the amount of uh, box office it was making. I mean, it was, it literally saved MGM, as this is what Nathanson said, the dirty dozen saved MGM's ass because in the fourth quarter of their uh, financial dealings, they were facing bankruptcy and they were on the brink. And the dirty dozen turned it all around. It it saved them from disaster. So, you know, and and there were um, you know there were predictions about how much money it would ultimately take, and it broke all those predictions from its initial release. This is 1967, if I remember correctly. I think ultimately it made like 26 million dollars, which is a hell of a lot of money in 1967. And keep in mind, this is also the year of of To Kill a Mon- I'm sorry, um, Cool Hand Luke. In the Heat of the Night, The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, um, um, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. A lot of great films. And it was a very important year in movies. It was a transitional year. Um, those movies I just mentioned were all classics, and they all uh, pushed the envelope a little further in terms of race relations, uh, violence, um, you name it. And, and, and The Dirty Dozen was the most popular of all of those films. So... It's interesting. Yeah. Well, you might, let's go, last one, we'll go even bigger, we'll pull the camera back even more. You note that by the time the film was released, there were over 22,000 U.S. casualties in Vietnam. And you note that the director, Robert Aldrich, had said that the original script was good for 1945, but not 1967. So if there's one sentence from your book I really remember that really made me say, wow, that's really that's really interesting, right? It's a great movie for 1945, but not for 1967. So can you talk about that? Sure. Absolutely. What, what he meant was movies, especially in 1945, because uh, that was the year the war ended, um, by World War II, but the movies that were being made, with the possible exec- uh, excuse me, exception of uh, The Best Years of Our Lives, which came out, I believe, in 47, and that dealt with the, uh, you know, the returning veteran and, and, and the effects of the war and PTSD and all like that, which isn't said, but it's shown the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and 1945, they were still making gung-ho war pictures that, that, that you know, go get them, boys. The U.S. is right. The Nazis are wrong and evil. And, and um, we've got to do the best we can to save the world for democracy. Well, by 1967, not a whole lot of people felt that way. I mean, of course, there was, is, and always will be. And, but... Robert Aldrich felt that because the, you know, the feelings of many Americans was changing, that that should be incorporated into a 1967 sensibility. And ultimately what he wound up doing was um, hiring another writer to do a rewrite on the uh, script that Nunley Johnson wrote, which really, really upset Nunley Johnson. He, he took it to arbitration with the Writers Guild because he didn't want anybody else's name on it but his, his but his own. And he lost that arbitration. So there was a co-screenwriting credit to Lucas Heller, who was kind of like in Robert Aldridge's stable. He worked on many of Robert Aldridge's scripts. And it did have a 1960s sensibility. I mean, there, you know, the scene where Lee Marvin and Ralph Meeker are talking and sharing a drink and uh, uh, Ralph Meeker says something to Lee Marvin along about the dozen that um, these, these men um, don't 
don't care for authority and they don't like listening to uh, or, or taking orders. And Lee Marvin tells them, do you? I don't know anybody who likes taking orders along those lines. And then he says something from and all of the other officers, uh, or something along those lines. And uh, Lee Marvin responds, well, that's because they haven't met the Germans. Germans haven't done anything to them yet because they don't really care. The Dutch doesn't really care about the fight. All they care about is a chance to uh, be free and you know to get out of prison. And that's, and that's the deal that uh, Major Weissman offers them. And that's something that I think struck a chord with audiences and critics that they weren't loyal patriotic Americans, the Dirty Dozen, who were willing to risk, risk their lives. They weren't doing that. They were indeed risking their lives, but not, not for the cause. They were doing it for selfish reasons. Yeah. And that's part of the six, 1967 sensibility. So this is a movie that would, you know, this is not Sergeant Stryker in the stands of Iwo Jima. Right, yeah, oh, exactly. Really good example. Yeah, it's a dead opposite well, of that, right? Yeah, or, you know, Wake Island or, or any, any number of movies that were made during the war that were very, very gung-ho. And similarly, you can't imagine now of this film being made because you can you can always imagine some producer saying, "How I get an idea? Let's take the Dirty Dozen and set it during the Vietnam War." But that, that seems unthinkable even for Hollywood. Well, that's interesting on a couple of levels. First of all, about twenty years later, no, no, excuse me, about ten to fifteen years later, Ian Nathanson wrote a sequel to the Dirty Dozen, and it takes place at the end of the war. John Reisman is the main character, and several of the dozen who survived in the book are also in the sequel. And what it is, it's about our entry into Vietnam, which actually started before the Vietnam War. It started um, during World War II, towards the end of World War II. And a lot of it is based on fact. I mean, there's fictional characters, of course, John Reisman and others, but it's based on the fact that uh, Nathanson discovered um, Ho Chi Minh um, and how you know as a communist and how he began leading the North Vietnamese army and and uh, you know and that's and that's really what the story is and Reisman who in the book is OSS he's not U.S. Army Reisman is given the mission to find out where the hell the Chinese stand during the war and where do the Vietnam you know the, actually it was uh, French into China then and where do they stand and whose side is on whose side and he goes on a fact-finding mission and that's the beginning of uh vietnam, our involvement in the vietnam war so you know in, in terms of you're saying they couldn't make a movie like that now i'd like to see them make a movie of uh it was called uh nathanson's book it's called a dirty distant war because it does have vietnam in it and um there there were i mean the the ripple effect of the Dirty Dozen is interesting because the last chapter in my book is all about the effect that movie had, uh, including two made-for-TV sequels, um, a short-lived uh, TV series, and a, about a zillion rip-offs <laughs> that, that use the same principle as a uh, plot line as the Dirty Dozen. And as recently as like a year or two ago, film director James Gunn, the guy who's now very hot with Gu Guardians of the Galaxy and Suicide Squad, he announced he was planning a, a remake of the Dirty Dozen, and it would be contemporary, and it would take place in urban America. But I, I haven't heard anything about it since, so I don't know if it's still going to go on or not. But, you know, that simple plot line of bad guys doing good things, which is the essence of the Dirty Dozen, it's proven itself extremely useful in Hollywood. Yeah, it's a useful template. So, yep. Dwayne, it's been great talking with you today. Killing Generals, The Making of the Dirty Dozen is available wherever books are sold. You can also get a copy linked from the New Books Network website. Thank you so much, Dwayne Epstein. Oh, thank you for having me. And if I may, I'd like to add that I don't know when this is going to air, but the book is available for pre-order on Amazon right now, even though the book comes out April 25th. So grab it while you can. You heard it here first. Thanks, Dwayne. Thank you.